Good evening. Good to be here with you tonight. I'm, I'm always thankful to be able to come home to Well uh, Somebody asked me, I don't even remember who it was, did I forget how to get here? Hugh Clark. I said, no, I won't ever forget how to get here. This will always be my home. I was here most of my life, and uh, I suppose that it will never change. I appreciate the opportunity to come and to speak. I'm always honored to be asked to go and to speak about God's Word somewhere, but at the same time tonight, when we talk about the home, I have never felt like I am adequate of a preacher to talk about the home. I have not raised my children, you know, where they've all turned out and everything's just wonderful. They're not grown yet, so I, I don't have all the answers. I, I'm not the perfect father. Made many mistakes, and my wife's here somewhere, I don't know where, but she would tell you I'm not the perfect husband. I've made a lot of mistakes. My father-in-law needs to be quiet because Becky said he's not the perfect husband either. So I, I don't ever feel like I deserve to be up here. And I've had to teach class at Zion on a whole quarter before on the home, and all of that's difficult. So tonight I'm going to go about it in a little bit different fashion. I don't want to talk about me and maybe the things that I have done or have not done and, and maybe experiences I've had in my life to try to help you. I want to talk to you about someone that always gets it right. Someone that always knows what to do. And, and you look at that title and you say, Jesus Christ has never been married. So how can you say that he knows what it's like to be married and to be a spouse to someone else? Just let me show you if, if you would. Just be patient with me, and I hope that all of these things will, will work out and you can understand where I'm going and, and it will benefit you in your life. I want to take you back. I want to take you back to the first home. All the way back to the beginning, you know that God created Adam and then later created Eve, and, and He told those two to come together and to have children, to be a home. And I want you to think about all of those things and maybe think about the details that happened back then. And I want to tell you that there's a little bit of a mystery that the Bible calls it at least. And you say, well, what do you mean? Well, I want you to go to Ephesians chapter 5. And I know what you're thinking. I thought you said you were going to go about it in a different way. Everybody here has talked about Ephesians 5. Well, I'm only going to talk about a couple of specific verses. You know, when I think about Adam and Eve and I think about that first home and then I turn my Bible over and I look at Ephesians 5, maybe one of the most popular passages about the home that we read and study today, I want us to hopefully get something from this here. Verse 21. Paul says, Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God, wives submit unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he's the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. Now I want you to pay special attention to these next three verses. The Bible says, For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. That goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 2, about verse 23, and also the next verse. For this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Now this passage is speaking about a husband and a wife, but it's also speaking about Christ and the church, and in doing so, they take it all the way back, the writer does, through inspiration, to the beginning. And he tells me something in verse 30, 30, 32. Excuse me. This is a great mystery, he says. He just quoted from Genesis chapter 2, 23 and 24, 
And he says, this is a great mystery. He says, but I speak of Christ and the church. And I want to think about that just for a second. Well, what does Paul mean here when he quotes from Genesis and he says, this is a mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. I, what I want to do, I want to take and I want us to make some comparisons. I love to develop lessons from the Old Testament being types and anti-types of things in the New Testament. I love to go back and to see things that, that happened before and all the things that we can learn from them of what's going on right now in the Bible. And I want to take and I want to compare Adam and Eve in that relationship to Christ and the church. I want you to look at Genesis ch chapter 2, verse 7. We see that God made a man. God sent a man, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 45, same thing said of Christ. Now God made a man in Genesis chapter 2. God sent a man in 1 Corinthians 15. But here's what I want you to see. Both grooms were from the Almighty. Both grooms came from God, came from above for a very specific purpose. Now I want to go on and I want to, I want to do this rather quickly because I want to get to the meat of our lesson. When we look at Adam and Eve and think about it, God purposed a bride for the groom. If you go back to Genesis chapter 2, God said it's not good for man to be alone, so man needs something. God purposed a bride. He did the same thing for the church. It was the internal purpose in Ephesians chapter 3. The bride was purposed for the groom, just like Adam and Eve, just like Christ and the church. In order for that to happen, there had to be a deep sleep. If you read in Genesis chapter 2, the Lord God caused Adam to go into a deep sleep in order for him to be able to have a bride, in order for Christ to be able to have a bride, what happened? Well, I've got sleep uh, in the quotation marks. He didn't sleep, he died. But it's similar in, in essence of what we're talking about. The contents that was taken from the side of the one of Adam were there to make the bride and the same is true from Christ and the church God told, caused Adam to fall into a deep sleep he took one of his ribs and he's going to use that rib when Jesus Christ died on the cross what happened a soldier came stuck the spear into his side and what came forth blood and water what did God do with that rib from the first man well he made him a bride what does God do with that blood and water that came forth from the side of Jesus Christ? Well, that's how we become part of the bride, right? By the blood and the water. What about the Scripture? I told you to pay special attention to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 30. It unites the two couples. Paul says there's a mystery going on here. You're thinking that he's talking about something else, but he goes all the way back to the beginning, to Genesis and he says, I'm really speaking about Christ and the church. Scripture unites these two couples because he quoted the same thing. The bride of Adam took the name of her groom. She was called woman because she was taken out of man. The bride, the church today, takes the name of the groom. Acts 20, verse 28, she's called that because he purchased her with his own blood. So the same is true in both. Both were commanded to leave and to cleave. If you go all the way back to the beginning, Adam and Eve, they were told to leave father and mother and to cleave to one another and become one flesh. What is the church, the bride of Christ, told to do? Leave father and mother. Luke 14, 26, you've got you to love your family less than me. You've got to leave them and you've got to go to me. The apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 1 told us that, that it's pleased God to separate him from his mother's womb and bring him unto his grace. He had to leave father and mother and he had to cleave. What did Jesus pray for in John chapter 17? That we be one with Christ. The first family had to leave and become one. Our spiritual family has to do the same. The bride of Adam and Eve is said to be the mother of all living. What about the bride of Christ? All of those that are in the bride of Christ, are they going to die? No, they're made alive. 
Poor are the saved. They're in the bride of Christ. So don't tell me that Jesus Christ does not know how to be a perfect spouse. Because he is the epitome of perfection when it comes to being a spouse. He understands what it's about and, and he does that for a very specific reason. Because he is our example, 1 Peter 2 verse 21. We've got to follow in his footsteps, do the things that he did. Be the kind of person that he was. We should strive to be more like him. And we should do that in our marriage within our families, within every part of our lives, we've got to try our very best to be more like Him. Now I want to think about Christ. Jesus Christ came down for a very specific purpose. Jesus Christ is the one that is quoted in the Bible as being the creator of all things. The one that is above all things, and yet Jesus Christ had the attitude that he came down not to be served, but to serve. Now, if I'm going to look at him as, a, as an example of what a spouse should be, I've got to keep this in my mind. I, I've got to focus on the, the aspect of Christ that he never, he never expected people to serve him he left a home where angels were worshiping him and he come here to serve to to wash his disciples feet to give his life upon the cross to to be all the things that he became for you and I he's a servant he's a servant now here's where I want to go with my lesson if I ask you tonight, what's the biggest problem in families today? I'm going to tell you it's one word. It's on the screen so you can cheat. It's one word. The biggest problem between husbands and wives is not money. It's not maybe adultery. It's not that they just fall out of love. It, it's selfish. You can agree or you can disagree, but if you want to be honest, it's true. When we are selfish people within our husband and wife relationship, and I've been selfish. I've been selfish a lot of times to my wife and to my children, and you have too. But you know, selfishness is what breeds all of these other things. Where do you think the sin of adultery comes from? selfishness where do you think all of these problems that people have come from it's from being selfish if you gain nothing else from this lesson I want you to realize that fact God always condemns being selfish God always expects us to be selfless that's what we're going to talk about if I want to be a better husband if I want to be a better father if I want to be a better Christian a neighbor, a friend, whatever it is in my life, I've got to learn to be selfless. Now, is that easy? No. Is it natural? Well, probably no. But can I do it? Yeah. You see, if every member of a family could learn to look out for one another's interest more than their own, you think things would change? You know, I've said many times, Matthew 7, 12, that little golden rule, if everyone would follow it, there would not be one problem in the world. Not one. But at the very center of that golden rule is selflessness. You do to other people what you want them to do to you. No one wants someone to be selfish to us. We want them to always be selfless. You know, I was thinking about my lesson tonight, and I come in from work, and I jumped in the shower like I do on a regular basis and reached up to grab the shampoo you know what wasn't there shampoo you know why because every time my boys run out you know where they go to dad's shower and they get his shampoo I wish they were here so you know they could hear that they chose to go to Zion tonight selfishness we all do it but we can do better I want you to go with me to Philippians 
And I want us to go to chapter 2. And I want us to talk about some things that Paul wanted us to understand as Christians. Well, I wish I had a clock somewhere. I have no idea what time it is. Don't care, just preach till I get done. That's what I like to hear. Philippians chapter 2. I want to begin in verse 3. Verse 3 and 4 of the Bible tells me exactly how to be the absolute best spouse that I could ever be. If I will only read it, if I will only understand it, and put it into practice. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, let nothing... Now, I got this out of the New King James. I'm, I'm a King James man, but I like the wording here better. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than himself. Let nothing, Paul says, that, that, that includes everything. Let nothing come between you and, and what you're supposed to be. Don't do anything because you're selfish. Selfish ambition. King James is going to say in vain glory. Do you realize life's not about me? And life's not about you. And all of you young people here, man, my wife and I tell our children all the time, life is not about you. And it will never be all about you. And if it is, you're doing what's wrong and you need to make it right with your God. But I've got to realize because of what that verse says, I can't do things about me. Because that's what, what my life is about. I want you to take a moment and I want you to think about something. Proverbs chapter 29 verse 18, the Bible says, where there is no vision, the people perish. Now, I know that you can take that and you can go a million different ways, but I want you to look at it in this way. Where there is no vision, if I can't see myself for what I am, what will I do? I'll perish. So I want you to have vision tonight. I want you to look at yourself and I want you to think about everything that goes on within your marriage, everything that goes on within your family, with your children. How much of self controls your decisions? Don't say it out loud. But answer it to yourself. In the decisions you make within that home, within day-to-day -day life, how much of it revolves around you and what you want? When you go out to eat, do you always have to go where you want to go? If you're going to go shopping, do you always have to go where it is you want to go? If you're going to go on vacation, does it have to be where you... Is life all about you? Does it revolve around you? What about your actions? How much of yourself is seen in your actions. Can we see it? Can you see when other people are selfish? You think your spouse can see when you're selfish? Yeah. But you know what happens so many times? So many times we can be so selfish and perhaps our spouse is more loving and more kind than us and they don't want to bring it to our attention. So that's why it's so important that you and I, we've got to be able to see it for ourselves. We've got to look within us and we've got to see, hey, am I really like that? You know, it's so easy when we talk about things like this for us to just shrug it off and say, I'm not selfish at all. I just do what everybody else wants to do. But is that really the truth? You see, you can fool yourself and you can fool people around you, but God Almighty knows. He knows everything. What about the last part of the verse? In lowliness of mind. The only way I can ever attain the place in my life to be selfless is I've got to learn to be humble. We're going to bring all of this back to Christ here in just a moment. But I've got to learn to be humble. In order for me to be pleasing, 
to Almighty God. That third beatitude, blessed are the meek. Meek. That word meek means one to be broken. One that has to be like an animal that has been tamed and now he's gentle. Some translations call it gentle instead of meek. Now he's humble. And now he submits himself unto someone else. In order for me to be a selfless spouse, a selfless family man, I've got to be humble. I've got to realize. I've got to realize who I am. That's the first beatitude. Blessed are the poor in spirit. I've got to save him for who I am. We've got to do that in our families. Philippians chapter 2 verse 4 Look not every man on his own things but also on the things of others. Don't just simply focus on your way. In essence that's what he had just said. But focus on others. Look at other people. Look at your spouse. Look at your children. Children look at your parents. Man that's a good lesson for you. Again, life's not all about you. You know, when you get to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the Bible tells us a lot of things about love. About how love is long-suffering, patient. Love is kind. Love doesn't vaunt itself. It's not puffed up. It, it doesn't brag about things. But I want you to notice what's in red. Is it showing up? It's not even showing up red up there. Love seeketh not her own. We're going to bring all of that back toward the end of this lesson. Love seeketh not her own. Love is never selfish. There's a very good reason for that. Here's where I want to focus on Christ. The very next verse says, Let this mind... What mind's he talking about? Verse 3 and 4. Verse 3 and 4. Don't do things out of selfish ambition and conceit or vain glory. Look out for other people, not just yourself. You've got to have that mind because that's the mind Jesus had. And if I want to look at him as being my example and my Lord, I've got to realize that I've got to strive to be more like him every day. If I want to be the perfect husband, not to will ever be a perfect husband. Or if, or if you want to be a, a, as near to perfect wife as you can be, you've got to be like Jesus. You've got to have the, the attributes that Jesus had. So when I go to that verse, and, and I think about let this mind. If I look up that word in the Greek in Strong's, and I, I'm not a big Greek person, I don't even know how to pronounce these words, and it really doesn't matter. But I can look up and I can understand what a word means. Paul says, let this mind. The word there means, and I've got it underlined. I've got to intensively to interest myself with concern or obedience when it applies to God. But it's an intensive thing that I've got to have within myself to do this. It's not an easy thing. I said at the beginning of the lesson, it, it's not easy. You're not going to walk away from the night service and all of a sudden not be selfish anymore. It's something that you've got to put some effort into. It's something that you've got to strive for every day of your life. It's something that when you make a mistake, you back up and you make it right and do better next time. But you see, we've got to have enough vision within us to see it. And I can see it in Jesus. I can see it in everything that he did. And perhaps Philippians chapter 2 is one of the most amazing passages, 6 through 8. A passage that, that I've never heard anyone really do justice on. Because I don't believe that we can grasp the meaning of all of it. But we can try. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Let's think about that just for a second. Now there's some biblical translations. I think the New American Standard Bible says who existed in the form of God and, and, and that's wrong. That's wrong because, and there's a very important reason for that. The Bible says who being in. That word in in the Greek means a fixed position. A fixed position. Jesus Christ has always been God, will always be God, never ceased to be God, even when he was a man on earth. That position, that place, that time, 
That title is fixed. Jesus Christ is God. Now, I don't know if you and I can fully grasp that. All of these things that are about to be said about him, we can't understand. In the beginning, God created Jesus Christ, right? Colossians 1.16, all things were created by, for him or by him and for him. In the beginning, God, that's him. In Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, at the burning bush, well, when Moses is talking, who, who is this? Well, what's your name? Well, I am. You just tell him my name is I am. You flip over to John 8, verse 58. Jesus says before Abraham was, what? I am. That's who we're talking about. We're talking about Jehovah God. Jehovah. Could Jehovah God be selfless? And I want you to ask yourself this question. If Jehovah God can be selfless, what excuse do I have? What excuse do I have to say that I, I can't be that? I can't. Yeah, we can. Being in the form. The form means the essence. Everything about Jesus was God, but he thought it not robbery. It, not robbery. The American standard says he thought equality with God a thing not to be grasped. And, and when you think about that word robbery, it means a thing to be seized. A thing to be seized. So Jesus Christ is God Almighty, Jehovah in the Bible. He's the everlasting Father in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 16. He's the Ancient of Days in Daniel chapter... He, he's everything. He's the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega in the book of Revelation. And he thought equality with God was a thing not to be seized. He felt it was something because of the deep love that he had for his creation that he could let go of some of those things that he enjoyed. Not that he ever gave up being God. Not that he ever gave up being divine but there were a lot of things he gave up. First and foremost, where do you read about a son of God in the Old Testament? Where do you read about one? You don't, do you? Isaiah 7, verse 14, 14 Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. His name will be called Emmanuel. Where do you read about the Son of God? You see, Jesus took on a completely different role. Completely different role. Now, I know that maybe is a lesson for another time. I study that a lot. But Jesus gave up a lot. He thought equality with God a thing not to be grasped, but made himself of no reputation reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Now again in the American Standard, verse 7, the Bible says, but he emptied himself. And in the King James, if you look up that word made and, and the phrase no reputation, they're the same Greek word, and they mean the same thing, to make empty. What did he make empty? Think about Jesus. Think about where he came from. He's there in heaven, sitting upon his throne with everything that he could ever desire. In Luke 9, verse 58, the Bible says, Foxes of the whole or earth have holes, and birds of the air has nests. But what did Jesus have? Nowhere to lay his head. 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9 tells us, Though he were rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that through his poverty you might become rich. Jesus Christ gave up so much. Why did he do it? Go back to verse 3 and 4, Philippians chapter 2. Why did he do it? Because he loved us and because he is absolutely selfless. 
He made himself of no reputation. I love that wording because think about it. Can you get a greater reputation than being God Almighty? But he was born of a virgin in a lowly place amongst lowly conditions, grew up the son of a carpenter, suffered shame and agony and death. Can you get more selfless? Is there any excuse that I can't be selfless? No. Think about that word servant. I like one C down there at Thayer's got devoted to another to the disregard of one's own interests. Can you and I be that in our marriages? Can we be devoted to one another and, and sometimes lay aside what it is that I want or what it is that I need because I'm devoted to you? Now we're going to come to some marriage vows at the end of this lesson if time permits. But that's exactly what you and I agreed to the day that we said I do. That was almost 19 years ago for me next month right over here. Right over here. But that's what I said. I'm going to be devoted and it's not about me. But I've broke those a lot of times. Because a lot of times it's been about me. Jesus Christ became God man. I don't understand that, and neither do you. But there's more to it. The Bible says, In being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He was found in fashion as a man, comprising everything about a man that you could comprise. Hebrews 4, verse 15, He was in all points tempted like we are, yet without sin. Matthew chapter 4, you can read about temptation that he endured he, he went through everything that you and I go through and he put himself through that he humbled himself what was it we said just a little earlier in order to be selfless what do I have to do I've got to have lowliness of mind what did he do how hard do you think it was for him to be lowly of mind you are a, per, or a divine being that is omniscient, that knows absolutely everything, but you're willing to make yourself of no reputation and to become a man. What is that equivalent to? I heard a preacher one time say that's like you and I becoming roaches. That's like maybe you and I becoming a maggot. I, I don't know how you want to describe it, and that doesn't even come close to comparing but Jesus Christ became a man? We don't understand how selfless that is. Because we can't grasp things like that. He humbled himself and became obedient even unto death, the death of the cross. Does a divine being die? A divine being is eternal, always has been, always will be. Does a divine being know anything about death? No. So in order for Jesus Christ to be our sacrifice, in order for you and I to have that atoning blood, he had to humble himself and become obedient unto death. You know, in John chapter 10, verse 17 and 18, the Bible tells us Jesus there is speaking. He says, I have the power to lay down my life and I have the power to take it up again. He said, no one can take it from me. He laid it down. And he took it up. I, I don't understand that. I don't understand how he could come to that point in his life to be that selfless, to experience all of those things that he went through out of love. Now I want to make application. We could talk a lot about Jesus and, and maybe we could understand a lot of things about his life, but if I don't apply it to me, 
if I don't get it to where you and I can, can gain something from it, well, then we've missed the point. When I'm supposed to have the mind of Christ, even within my marriage, even within my family, I've got to realize a few things. Only a selfless person can do certain things. The number one thing I've got up there is truly love. Now, maybe there's a lot of people in the world that say that they love someone, but their selfish actions demonstrate otherwise. You cannot truly love your spouse. You cannot truly love your children. Children, you cannot truly love your parents if you're a selfish individual. It doesn't work that way. Because you can. And I'm going to prove it in just a minute. Unless you're selfless, you can't be patient. You say, well, no, I don't know about that. I'm going to prove it in a minute. Unless you're selfless, you can't be compassionate with other people. Five minutes. Unless you're selfless, you're going to be a person with a lot of regret. If we took turns going around the room tonight and each one of us told a story about an interaction between our families where we were selfish, would you have regrets about telling that story? About remembering that thing that happened? Whatever it was, I know we all would. We had more time to talk about it. Only a selfless person never gives up. When people give up on a marriage, when people give up on their family, it's because they're selfish. It's not because they're a selfless individual. And I know all of that because when the Bible talks about love, it gives me those answers. We said only a selfless person can truly love. And you cannot deny that because Jesus Christ was the very essence of that. He was a selfless individual that loved us so much that he was willing to do all the things that we talked about. Love suffers long. There's your patience. Love is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not vaunt itself. It's not puffed up. Does not behave itself unseemly. Seeketh not her own. Is not easily provoked. Thinketh no evil. Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. And you cannot love without being selfless. I've got two slides and I, I'll be quiet. When you think about marriage vows, I've got two different sets here. This one perhaps a traditional. I take you to be my whatever, lawfully wedded wife, to have and to hold from this day forward for better, worse, richer, poor, sickness and health, to love and to cherish from this day forward and the death do us part. And maybe a lot of you said those exact same things. How can you do those and be a selfish person? But I want to go to the next one. I found this one. It's called modern marriage vows. A lot of times when we use the word modern, we get afraid because a lot of times when things are modern, it changes some things. But I like these even better. I love you. You are my best friend. Today I give myself to you in marriage. I promise to encourage and inspire you. Now that screams selflessness, doesn't it? I promise to encourage and inspire you, to laugh with you, to comfort you in times of sorrow and struggle. I promise to love you in good times and in bad. When life seems easy, and when it seems hard. I've not been married as long as a lot of you, but could you all amen that? Sometimes life's easy. Sometimes loving my wife is easy. Sometimes her loving me is hard. That's the same for a lot of you. Becky could amen that one, right? When our love is simple and when it's an effort, I promise to cherish you, to always hold you in highest regard. These things I give you today and all the days of our lives. 
So when you and I said those vows, and I know probably everybody in here said different vows, you made certain promises. And at the very center of all of those promises was an attitude of selflessness. And when we're selfish, we break all of those vows. When you and I became a New Testament Christian, we became the bride of Christ. And when we're a selfish Christian, we break those vows too. Think about that and I'll pick that thought up during our invitation.